Blackstone reported results in the last hour. The private equity giant earning a dollar one share. And that's nine cents better than expectations. Revenue coming in at $2.43 billion, just ahead of estimates. Uh, for more on the numbers and uh, the remarkable amount of money that's inflowed into this uh, firm, John Gray, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Blackstone Group. Good morning to you, John. How are you? Good morning, Andrew. Great to be with you. Want to talk about these earnings and then want to maybe delve a little bit deeper into what's happening as you see it from your portfolio in, in the economy. But we were just talking about the inflows and, and this idea that we now have you have one point one trillion dollars with a T. That's a record high for you. Yeah, it, it is remarkable. When I joined the firm back in 1992, we had less than a billion dollars and it's been an incredible run. It's a testament to the vision of Steve Schwarzman, the talent of our people and delivering for our customers. And that's what we did in the quarter. We had uh, the highest appreciation in total uh, amount in the funds in three years. We deployed more than $54 billion, the highest amount in two years. And on the fundraising, which you noted, more than $40 billion came in, getting us over a trillion one. I think the key why this is happening is really twofold. One is we're seeing a healing of capital markets. You see it every day on your program. Debt markets are better. Equity markets are better. And the second thing, which is really important for us, is we focus on some of the best neighborhoods out there, data centers, energy and power, India, private credit. We like to say where you invest matters. And driving performance, leaning into these great areas is so critical for us. You just talked about deploying capital. I want to talk about where you're deploying that capital, but also to the extent that you're trying to harvest capital, which I'm not sure we're there yet. Well, look, on, on the deployment side, transaction activity has definitely picked up. And when you think about a cycle when things are recovering, you want to lean in, invest before the all clear sign, which we've been talking about. That's why we've invested more than $120 billion over the last year. In terms of the harvesting side, that's been the one area that's lagged, but that's what happens. You sort of plant the seeds first and then harvest. And as we look forward, there's some very good signs. We've seen interest rates come down, both short and long rates. Spreads have tightened a bunch. You know, we've seen anywhere from 100 to 200 basis points of tightening in corporate real right. estate credit. We continue to see liquidity coming in the marketplace. The banks who you've been talking to the last few days are much more open to lending money. The commercial mortgage-backed security market is fourfold bigger in terms of volume now. And the equity market is definitely improving, as you know, record highs. And I think the next tumbler to fall into place will be the IPO market. And when we look out in 2025, I think we'll begin to see more of that. We're having discussions now that are not just theoretical about taking companies public, but really practical. And that happens as equity markets strengthen. It's like a magnet pulling companies into the public markets. And that's another reason we have optimism as we look forward. Um, I wanted to take a quick pause for half a second. Steve Leisman is at the desk uh, with us right now. And we've got some breaking news, I believe, from the ECB. And then we'll come back to you, John, in just a moment. European Central Bank, Andrew, cutting interest rates uh, by a quarter point on the deposit rate down to three and a quarter uh, by uh, 0.25 on the benchmark refinancing rate. This is the first time the European Central Bank has cut interest rates consecutively since 2011. Speaks to a global uh, uh, cutting cycle of which the Fed has been a little bit behind the curve or other central banks going a little bit more slowly and just very quickly i haven't had a chance to look at the outlook here um interest rates on the possibility were down three and a quarter uh pandemic emergency programs are declining so they're reducing their balance sheet and i'll come back to you later expected inflation to rise again before declining mm. to target so that's interesting um their headline was was down below their their their, their core was higher um, and they're not going to pre-commit to a particular rate path. So largely expected another cut coming, but, right. but not expected for the ECB to uh, forecast that definitively. Fair enough. Uh, stay where you are, Steve. I want to get back to John Gray, and maybe you can speak to what we're hearing from the ECB, but also where you think the Federal Reserve is going to be, uh, at least for the next uh, couple of months. Do you believe that there's going to be two cuts? Do you think there's going to be less, more? 
And I'd love for you to comment on, it's a competitor who said it, but, you know, um, Mark Rowan, who runs Apollo, said he didn't think that actually uh, the Fed needed to be cutting at all. Well, I would say uh, we're not surprised by what the ECB has done here. We see inflation broadly cooling around the world. Uh, if you look in the U.S., what we see is we survey our companies, and in the third quarter, wage growth dropped below 4 percent. That was the first time in the post-COVID period we've seen that. When you look at rental housing across our large single-family, multifamily uh, portfolios, we see those housing costs growing at less than 2 percent versus the 5 percent in the government CPI data. That's the biggest component of CPI. So I think the data gives the Fed air cover. We're in the camp that the Fed has room to lower rates. Their mission here is twofold, as you know, which is to look at the price stability inflation. There they're getting good data, and that will allow them to focus on their other mandate, which is employment. And so I would be in the camp that the Fed will lower rates. They're going to do it deliberately because they have a healthy economy, but they do have room to cut right. because the data reflects that. Hey, John, I have a, uh, an economic question, but it's, it's tinged with at least politics or policy, which is to say, yesterday, Stan Druckenmiller suggested that he believed that former President Trump would become the president. If that is the case, uh, there is a likelihood of a, uh, mer a massive tariff program. I'm curious how you think about that as it relates to preparing for it, uh, given all of the portfolio companies that you own and what you think it would do to the businesses? Well, we obviously have a ways to go on this election. But I think um, if you had uh, former President Trump win, tariffs would obviously be part of the equation. I do think it's important to keep in mind where things ultimately land. What will be the size of the tariffs? which countries will be affected, which industries. And that may look different than what's being discussed today. It's hard to know. And I think as investors, it's hard to speculate. You want to be thoughtful. Yes, I think we'll have tariffs. We did have tariffs in the first Trump administration that continued in the Biden administration. But I think we've got to wait a little bit and see. But certainly, companies in export-oriented industries have to be thinking about the impact.